We're in 1 Peter today, if you remember again, 1 Peter chapter 3. And today is actually the, uh, it's like the fourth part of a, uh, of a four-part series. While well, Pastor Scott took the first two parts and I took the uh, second two parts, uh, as you look at it, all this, these last four these last four sections of 1 Peter have talked about um, relationships and basically submission to authority and how do you handle relationships, whether inside or outside the church. The first one we dealt with uh, four weeks ago now, um, uh, that's a month, wow, uh, was talking about that between citizens and their government. Of course, it would have been a great one for today also, talking about our freedom and the Independence Day, but citizens and the government. Uh, the second week we dealt with um, masters and slaves or employers and employees and how that relationship goes. The third week, which was last week, we dealt with the situation of what do you do with between husbands and wives and how do you handle that relationship and things go on there. Today in this fourth, um, this fourth uh, sermon in this series, the fourth section in 1 Peter that deals with this subject, uh, he's going to hone in on um, how we handle each other and our relationships within the body of Christ, and to a certain extent, outside the body of Christ also. And he actually, it, it, he points that out as you look at this section, because he says in the first very beginning of this, in verse 8, to sum up. So to sum up, he's kind of in a summary fashion here, going to look over relationships and how they work. As we look at the first one, I've, I've taken verses 8 and 9, and I've uh, entitled it, New Testament Directives for the Church. New Testament directives for the church. What should we be like in the church? And how do we, how should we live? And the very first one that he puts at the very top of his list is to be harmonious, to be like-minded. Now, this is not um, to be um, uniform or exactly the same, but it's to be unified. Okay, not to be uniform, but to be unified. Um, not to necessarily sing in unison, although that's pretty, but to sing in unison, but to sing in harmony. Now, um, as one person, I, of course, can't sing harmony all by myself, um, although you have some of these artists that record all four parts of a song, and then they're kind of putting it all together, and they sing the whole, all the parts. But there's nothing uh, in my mind that's almost as beautiful as having harmonies, especially tight harmonies that are just gorgeous, to put together a cappella, just nothing else. Just, just harmonies together, and it sounds so gorgeous. I mean, exact unison sounds good also, but it's very hard to be exactly in unison when you're singing, to get exactly the same pitch, not to be off at all. Very difficult, and it's also very difficult for the church to be exactly in unison every time and to not to be, uh, be, able, to be able to sing harmony, but it's important to do that. Uh, let's take the example of a, of a baseball team. Now, we should talk probably about a different baseball team than the Phillies right now, but uh, as, you, as you think of a baseball team, my son was a, a first baseman, and he was a lefty. And I, as I followed his career through school and so forth, I found out that you know lefties are very um, beneficial at first base. You know, you want a lefty at first base because they can reach further for the ball, you know, and it's just, it's just a, a lefties do well at first base. That's because that's, that's where they go. And then, of course, when you have a pitcher, you've got your south poles, you know, and you've got, you've got your lefties and righties, and, and they're better against some hitters, whether they're left or right. And, you know, if you have a, of a, have a, a pitcher coming on, you're going to have a substitute pitcher. Sometimes they pick whether a pitcher is a, a lefty or a righty uh, as a pitcher, depending upon who the next batter is coming up the bat. And then there's the outfielders, and there's the infielders, and each person has their own spot on the team. And not everybody plays the same position or is equally talented at the same position. Uh, when I played baseball, they always put me out in right field because they figured the fewest amount of balls come to right field, so that was a safe place to put me. And uh, I remember one game, I mean, I, you know, Jean, I remember this so much, it just ingrained in my head. I'm out there in right field, you know, and they never took care of, I mean, we had, our field was not even at all. It had all these bumps and lumps and rocks and everything else in it, you know, I'm out there. And so I'm, a ball gets hit out the right field. Well, I'm gonna, it was a ground ball, and I'm gonna be exactly the way they're supposed to do it. So I get down, and I'm, I'm all down on the ground. I got my, my, my glove right down on the ground, just the way it's supposed to be. And once you know, that ball hit a, hit a, on a lump or a rock right in front of me and went straight over my head, all the way to the back. 
And I go chase him, totally embarrassed, you know. Well, went to, as luck would have it, another ball got hit out the right field later. Well, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. I may be look dumb, but I'm not. Okay, so I get down there and I get a, a few inches off the ground so I can, you know, kind of jump up and stop the ball. And once you know, it didn't hit anything. Where'd it go? Right under my glove, all the way to the wall. You know, I mean, they didn't even put me in the right field after that. But, you know, uh, everyone's got their talents and a place to go. You know, and I could not throw really well later on, you know, from, from outfield. I just don't have a great arm. I like to play third base. You know, and, and third base was a place where, you know, I could possibly throw from third to first. You know, I could reach that far, but I always had to be careful, you know, because I wanted to make sure I got the first base. But everybody's got their talents. My point is, in the church, each one of us has, has different abilities. And we're not all going to be uniform doing the same thing. There are some people that Pastor Scott probably does not want on the worship team. Okay? Uh, there are, they probably all sing, you know, uh, we don't call it unison, we call it, uh, you know, monotone, you know? They got that one tone they can sing, and that's only, so, uh, you know, that's not their place probably. But you know what? That person might be, have, a, have a great place doing something else. And there might be people that, you know, do well at changing diapers, and they'll say, Pastor, you will never get me in front of the church, not even to make an announcement. I do not belong in the front of the church, you know? And so, I mean, why would I drag them up here to make announcements if that's not what they really feel good to? Now, sometimes we need to be pushed, you know, because we might have a, a spot where we really could be used well, and so getting challenged to do something new is okay. But we well, gotta realize that every person has a spot. And what's important in the church is not that we're all singing the exact same tune, but that we're all headed in the same direction, you know? Um, a person might be going this direction, and one person might be able to, to go in that direction in a, in, a, in a different way than another will, you know, and we kind of help each other out. But you can't have one person going this direction and another person going this direction. That doesn't work. And so consequently, when Peter talks about believers, the very first thing he puts on his list is, let all harmonize. Be harmonious. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, uh, just let me read this, this section from the Apostle Paul, which, which confirms this, the importance of this particular thing, the fact that we need to be of the same mind. He says here, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. You see, it's not about me or you. It's about the body. And where are we going to go? We need to be able to harmonize with each other. We need to be the same mind. In uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 16, and I've, I've listed these verses if you, as you're taking notes this morning. You can look under and, and follow those verses if you want to uh, look at them yourselves later on and study them. But it says in Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Uh, Romans 15, 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 3, 15. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if any one of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. So we need to be of the same attitude, the same mind, focusing on the same thing, moving in the same direction. When I first went in the past, with the, you know, there, was a, there were a number of books, a couple of books that I really liked. One was called Well-Intentioned Dragons. And you have to, have you read that one? Uh, a, a great book, especially, uh, I mean, all my elders read it when we first came on board because, I mean, there, there were some people in the church that just, I mean, uh, they seemed to be well-intentioned, but boy, they were just dragons, and they would just, you know, tear the church down. And there was another book I, I used to like to call, it was called um, An Antagonist in the Church, you know, um, people that just can, can be such a, a, a critical person uh, and, and just tear the church down. And I've had that in past churches, you know, you've come across those kind of, and I, and I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to jinx our church, I'm not, I'm not sure that's a good term for a pastor to use, you know, uh, but I, as I look over our church over the past years, you know, we've not had that, we've not had a level of discontent like that. I'm not saying nobody's never been unhappy or nobody's ever gone to another church or whatever, but we've been, we've been in good harmony. 
and I hope that's somewhat because our leadership has also been in harmony. But it's, it, we need to have the same attitude and the same harmonious way of working. And it's each of our responsibilities. And if a person is, is good on one thing, it's easy to be critical at another. You know, the, you know the best way not to be critical? Be involved. You know, it's the person sitting on the sidelines, the person that's not doing anything, the person that's, that's doesn't re that doesn't really have any flesh in the game, as we say, that's so easy to be critical of some, someone else, some other team member that they don't think is doing a good job or doing it right. Well, you know what? Get in and be a part of it and fix it. You know, be involved and um, be a part. And so I'm glad we've been able to be that way for a good bit, as far as I can see. In the, in, in for a number of years, but we need to continue to be that. And that's why Peter puts it at first, because it's so critical. We need to be harmonious with not just the people in the church that are believers, but people outside the church that are believers, people from other churches. The second thing he says is coming down here is be sympathetic. This is a feeling uh, relating closely to others, uh, what we feel, and uh, be close to them. Uh, the word actually uh, means to suffer along with, uh, to, to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and suffer with them. And as you look at what we're going to go through in the next few weeks of the sermon, you're going to find Peter's going to talk about suffering. And uh, this talks about being able to be sympathetic towards others, be able to put yourself in their place. Uh, we really don't, and, I, and maybe uh, they'll bring it up in the next few weeks, I hope so, as we, we're going through some of these. Uh, we really don't understand what it's like to be a Christian in a lot of these other countries. We really don't have a feeling for that. I mean, this, this, this lady that's still, uh, I think they say still have her over, was it Nigeria? Um, you know, uh, she, was, she was never a Muslim, as far as I understand, but, uh, you know, they, they had her in jail, and she had her baby in jail, and uh, they said they were going to uh, kill her after, you know, she had the baby, and then they postponed that. Finally, they let her out of the country, and she was about to get on an airplane to get out of the country, and they, they rearrested her for having false uh, paperwork. Well, what's all that all about? You know what I mean? We just really don't understand what it's like in many parts of the world. And this is what uh, he, he wants us to be sympathetic to others, to be able to place ourselves in their shoes. In Romans 12, 5, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In one of the passages, it talks about membership in the church. It talks about the fact that we're members of one another. It says this. It says, If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. We like it. We did that this morning. You know, you had two graduates. That's great. It's great to rejoice with them, to be happy with them. And when someone like Eleanor Golden is suffering from uh, cancer right now or whatever, we, we weep with that person and we, and we support them. We pray for them. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Be sympathetic. Be, be able to put yourself in someone else's place and feel what they're feeling. And then the third thing he says is be loving. Um, be brotherly to them. Uh, I think of the word Philadelphia when I think of that. The, live, the, the uh, town of brotherly shove, as some people say. <laughs> Hopefully not. But brotherly love. Phileo, Adelphia. Brotherly love. Phileo means love of, of, uh, of a brother. You know, and Adelphois, of course, uh, it's love, and, and Adelphois or Adelphi is brother. Brotherly love. Uh, loving, for the, loving the brethren. In John 13, 35, it says, By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you, what? love one another, if you love one another. That's how people know that we're part of the body of Christ, because we have that love for one another. They come and say, oh, your church is such a loving church, or you, you know, you're such a friendly church. Well, I hope we're not only just a friendly on the surface church, I hope we're, we're friendly in depth, you know, that we're willing to get to know each other. That's why we've named Tag Sunday, you know, and that, that uh, you might get to know one another, know by a first name, and be able to greet someone else. And uh, if you don't have the, if you can't remember the name this week, you know, August 3rd, we'll have another one, you know, and, and try to memorize someone's name. Try to get to know who they are. Ask them about themselves, you know, where they work or what they do for, for how if they're married, if they have kids or whatever. Get to know one another. Brotherly love. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. In Hebrews 13, 1, it says, let love of the brethren continue. And in 2 Peter, Peter's second book here, in 2 Peter 1, 7, it says, And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. 
I've tried to put some of these verses down. If you're taking notes there, I've tried to list these verses underneath it and just kind of underline some of the ones or, or note some of them. If you, or if you want to go through them in the week, look up some of those verses. But this is Peter's litany, litany list of how we need to act as believers. The fifth thing he says is to be compassionate, to be kind-hearted. This is a doing thing. As in sympathetic might be a feeling thing, being compassionate or being kind-hearted is a doing thing. Doing things for other people, actions that come from feelings deep within oneself. Saying, you know, I, I have compassion for you because of something you're going through or some situation I know, and so consequently I'm going to do something to show that. In Ephesians 4.32 it says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Each one of us has been forgiven by God. Can you imagine what it would be like to not be a believer? Where would you be this morning if you didn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you, don't, if you didn't put him in a high priority in your life? Maybe be sleeping off a gig from the previous night? Maybe you'd be out, you know, just, uh, you know, golfing the day? Some people say, my, I wouldn't mind being golfing, you know? But I hope you enjoy being here more. I hope being God's people, being around people that love God, where they think it's important that, that you're here to get to know someone else, I hope that's important to you. To be able to, to be compassionate for someone else. Christ had compassion. I think it was when in the section where he was feeding the 5,000, it says he, had comp he looked at them and had compassion on them as sheep that had no shepherd. You have compassion on others. Do we really see where other people are? When you're talking to people in the body, you know, over, over uh, you know, the fellowship hut from 10.30 to 11 between the two services, you know? Do you reach out and talk to somebody that may be sitting by themselves or that you don't know from a previous time? Well, hi, how you doing? My name is Joe or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know? Uh, what brings you to church today? Or where are you from? Get to know one another to be compassionate and kind-hearted. It says in Colossians 3.12, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then the last thing he mentions here, of, I guess this is the fifth thing, uh, compassion was the fourth, and is to be humble. Don't over-inflate your own importance. Be humble. It says in Proverbs 23, 7, For as a man thinks within himself or in his heart, so is he. There's that, there's that verse that says, you know, you know, don't be too proud. Take, let a man be, take heed lest he fall. You know, uh, you know don't, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. In Romans 12, 3, it says, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as to have sound judgment as God has allowed to each a measure of faith. Uh, I went down to see my daughter's uh, uh, graduation from uh, AIT many years ago. And uh, but they, they covered the uh, gym floor with, uh, with a tarp, so you wouldn't get all marks on it. I happened to be a major at the time, and so I went in uniform. You remember Chris? If Chris remembers that, and you know, well, I thought that's pretty neat. You know, I'm a dad, and I'm a dad, and I got a daughter in this uniform, and so in, in uniform, and going to IT, and and I remember going across the, and I picked up some food someplace. They had a, they had some food over there, and I was walking back across the floor, and my foot got caught on the tarp, and I started going headlong, and I caught myself, but I probably went a good 15 or 20 feet, thinking I was going to lie flat on my face. You know, and here I am, a major. You know, that's, that's, that's a half, halfway decent rank in the Army, you know. And I'd be the only guy laying face down, you know, in front of all these people. Well, praise God, I didn't actually fall. And I didn't look to the left or right to see who noticed how long, far I stumbled before I caught myself. But, you know, you, know you, you, you draw attention to yourself, and all of a sudden, what? You risk becoming a failure, you know, and, and, and going down. So try to be humble. You know, I, I, I really try to work on this myself because if, if I take credit for myself on something, then I, don't, I deflect it away from God. And, you know, we need to be able to give him the credit for what we do. In a heartbeat, we could be gone. How much our family knows that. 
your life can change so quickly. We should, instead of taking pride in ourselves, we ought to give, give our, our accolades to God. Humility is one of those things that as soon as you know that you have it, you've lost it. As soon as you know you have it, it's gone. Moses was called one of the, one of the most humble guys in Scripture. And, uh, you know, I don't know that he had a lot of confidence. Or he was the one that says, oh, I, 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 I stammer. I, I, I can't be a leader, you know. And God says, well, let your brother Aaron talk for you. He didn't give him any way out. But Moses was not, I don't think, the most super confident of guys. And he made some mistakes along the way, such as when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. But he learned. And he was a humble person. Think of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Peter himself said, don't wash my feet, Lord. You know, I'm, I mean, I, you know, I can't let you do that. And Jesus Christ said, I have to. I have to. Be humble. And then in verse 9, he moves on to, with an interesting verse to give perspective on what about those that uh, do you wrong? How do you treat them? I mean, it's one thing to say, I'm going to love my brother in Christ, you know, the person who sits next to me, and I'm going to get to know them. But what about evildoers? Or what about, God forbid, that other Christian who tries to undercut what you're doing or is critical of you? What do you do to that, about them? And the scriptures in verse 9, Peter recommends not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you are called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Why are you a Christian? Well, you know, we're Christians because we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and is the only way to get to heaven. But there's a blessing for doing that. I mean, we're going to get heaven forever. And, and Peter acknowledges that. We're going to get a blessing that we don't deserve. And so that's a neat thing for God. God is, God is offering us a blessing. And if we're going to inherit a blessing, why shouldn't we be willing to give a blessing? To someone even when they don't deserve it. If someone does evil to us, give them a blessing instead. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And I must admit, I'm sometimes a spiteful person. <laughs> you know, I, I say, God, I hope you get them. <laughs> if they take something that, if they, if they steal something from me, uh, you know, I, I hope it blows up in their face, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, you know, how do we reproach that? You know, if someone takes something from us, how do we follow? And God says, give a blessing. Vengeance of the mind. He'll take care of things. Remember, the person that does something bad to you or is, and is not a believer, just keep this in mind. This is the only heaven they will ever know. This is as best as it gets. They're going to spend eternity away from God in hell paying for their own sins. Give them a blessing. It's the only one they're going to get. Be gracious to them because we have received a blessing. We were evil. We were sinners. We had our back turned from God. But we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and he has given us a blessing. I forget where we were the other day. We were in a store. We were coming back from uh, Vermont seeing her brother. And um, I remember I walked out and I said to the lady, uh, you know, Lois is paying the bill. And I said, uh, God bless you. And she looked kind of, oh, well, God bless you too. You know, I mean, just her face lit up. You know, I, I try to remember that, to, to, to give a blessing to somebody, to, to, to in some way try to draw them to God. I mean, I can't stand there. I probably could, I guess, but uh, if, if I was a crew, maybe I'd do that, you know. But I, I'm not going to be able to stand there and give them the whole four spiritual laws or, or how to get saved right there. But uh, I hope that, that giving them a blessing and, and directing their attention to God might be something that lightens their day and cause them to think about God. I mean, I don't know where that lady is this morning, but uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe just saying God bless you got her thinking about, I should go to church this Sunday, I don't know. But give a blessing. Don't try to just destroy or be mean or to someone who has done you wrong. Give them a blessing. And then we move to the second part here, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament to the Old Testament. And Peter looks at the Old Testament here, some of the, some of the scriptures, and he actually uh, quotes Psalm 34, 12 through 16 here. Um, as support for godly actions in our lives. And the first thing in, in verse 10, and, 
and I could preach, I have preached whole sermons on this subject in the past. Um, I'll let you just take a look if you want at James chapter 3, verses 2 through 10. It talks about the tongue. It says in verse 10, Let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Sometimes it's difficult not to let something come out of our mouth, you know, that we shouldn't let come out of our mouth. How many times have you said something and you wish you could take it back, you know? Uh, same way with me. I say some pretty dumb stuff sometimes. You know, you just wish you could stop it. And controlling the tongue is so difficult. And if you want a sermon in a nutshell, read that James 3 passage. It will tell you exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it in order to work to control your tongue. Um, I've never had a problem with cursing in my life, praise God. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I have to rethink it because I'm around a lot in the military, you know, and you've got to make sure that you're not using that kind of language. Uh, some of you may have a problem with that. You know, maybe, it's, maybe in the home, maybe your kids have heard it. Maybe they've heard it outside. Um, but, you know, just one foul word out of your mouth can really impact your testimony for Jesus Christ, you know? And it's so easy to slip. And that's what he's saying here. He says, he says, refrain your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile or speaking nastiness or talking bad about somebody. We need to clean up our mouth as much as possible and always continue to progress. It doesn't mean you'll never slip, but don't give yourself an excuse to slip. Control your speech. And then verse 11, he says, don't only control your speech, but also control your actions. If we can go to the next slide there and take a look at the control your speech and then control your actions in verse 11. Uh, it says in uh, Psalm 37, uh, 27, depart from evil and do good so you will abide forever. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from every manner or every form of evil. In 3 John 11, it says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. So in verse 11 here, it says, And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace and pursue it. What do we do in our lives? How are we entering our everyday interactions with others? It says, let us turn away from evil and do good. It says, especially in, in Galatians 6, 9, and 10, I love this verse, it says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall weep if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially to fellow believers. We should not only conduct our speech in a way that pleases God, but our actions in a way that pleases God so that others will know that we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. It should be evident. And then lastly, in verse 12, it says that God reacts accordingly with his posture. And if you look in verse uh, 12, you'll find that it talks about his eyes, his ears, and his face. It says in his eyes, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. You want God looking down on the righteous you want him looking at yourself. You want him keeping his watchful eye over you. Not only his eye of protection, but his eye of blessing. And then it says, and his ears attend to their prayers. If you follow what God wants you to do, he'll listen to your prayers. Now, it's interesting. You look back at verse 7, and it says there to husbands, treat your wife with honor as a fellow heir of Christ so that your prayers may not be hindered. We need to treat our wives right, and we all need to not do evil, but to do good, so that God's ears are listening to us. What's that, what's that fraction, uh, uh, phrase? Don't turn a deaf ear or a blind eye, you know? You don't want guys, God's eyes to be blind, and you don't want his ears to be deaf to us. And Peter here gives us the formula for how to know that God's eyes will be watching for us and his ears will be listening. Now, if you want to insult somebody, what's one of the, one of the worst ways you can insult someone? Turn your back on them, Ken. 
That's, that's even a phrase, you know. Turn your back on somebody. It's an insult. It's the way we show displeasure with someone else. I don't think I've ever done this. I don't know if I would survive it. But, if, but you, you don't just, when someone's talking to you, you know, if, if my wife and I are talking, if I turn my face and just look the other way, ignore her, I think I'd be in trouble. Probably, wouldn't I? <laughs> A lot of trouble, you know? You don't want to do that. So what's this say? But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If we don't live the right way, God's face will look up against us. It says in one of the, one of the, one of the uh, benedictions we use, make your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance upon us. We want God to be watching over us. We want him to be facing us, not facing away from us. And that's what happens when we do evil. That's what happens when others do evil. And that's why, give them a blessing, because I'll tell you what, God's going to turn his face away from them. And that's the worst place to be in life is God looking the other way. Today is our time as we come before the Lord's table to take an attitude and an action check. We should be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, blessing for evil and insults. That's what our, that's what our actions should be like. This morning... If you want God's blessing, you have to ask for his blessing to others. If you want God's blessing, bless others. That's the simple words. Are you willing to ask God's blessing for others? As we come before the Lord's table this morning, we recognize that we are all evil inside. We've done things to offend God, and yet God still gives us his blessing, doesn't he? Let us, as we take of the Lord's table this morning, let's evaluate ourselves in those areas and ask, are we following God the way he wants us to? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank